Well, everybody doing good? Got some new people, got some new visitors. Thanks for coming. And uh, who, where are you guys from? Amarillo, Texas. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, well, it's, th- we're glad you're here. We're glad you joined us. Like, like it says up here, Psalm 118, we went through part one. Uh, when was it? Three, three weeks ago? There was an ice storm, so it threw me off. Like three weeks ago, something like that. We went through the first seven verses, and I'll do a recap so you guys can be with us. Um, but tonight we're going to look at the rest of the chapter, Psalm 118. That is uh, the verses 8 through 29. And uh, so before I get into that, let's, do, let's, let's pray, and then I'll do a little recap. Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your body. Thank you for the gifts that you give us in the church that we can support each other. Thank you for the hands, the feet, and thank you for the head of Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, be with us tonight and make us fertile soil so that your words can penetrate deep into our lives and produce fruit. I love you, Father. It's in your Son's name I pray. Amen. So, last uh, three weeks ago, uh, I presented four reasons why I thought that this psalm in particular was all about the Messiah. It wasn't about David. It wasn't about some random person, which a lot of people in commentaries think that's true that it's just either about David or a random person. I put four reasons, and I'm going to keep putting forth my case tonight why I think this is actually about the Messiah, not about another man. So I had these four reasons. Um, Jesus was in the city on a donkey. These people were shouting messianic titles. This psalm is quoted. Um, Jesus alludes to the fact that he is the stone that the builders rejected, that he is what this psalm is talking about there. David, the author, when it says stuff like, I shall not die, but I shall live, um, David died, and he's still dead. So I don't think that this is about him. Uh, And the overall layout of the book of Psalms, we talked about that, that the book of Psalms is actually split up into five separate books with an intro and an ending. And when you read them consecutively, then you'll start to realize that at the end of those books, there are there are literally endings that, that kind of cap that, that portion of uh, Psalms. And in the portion that we're looking at, it, it talks about this, uh, the king of David, the reigning of David, this promise that God gave to David about this messianic king that would come, this anointed one. And so even though it says David in a lot of the Psalms, the later Psalms, it's actually referring to the son of David. Sometimes it's interchanged in, in Scripture. David is actually a messianic title sometimes. Um, we talked about this idea of rejected and accepted throughout the, a lot of the book of the Bible. It's, it's a theme. I only hit on three people, and that was Moses, David, uh, Joseph, which we've studied Joseph, right? And if you guys were here for that, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's this idea that they were rejected, they were accepted by the Gentiles, and then they came back and were accepted, and they brought salvation. Um, Joseph, Moses, and David all did that. Um, we talked about Stephen in Acts chapter 7. A lot of his sermon here, right before he got stoned to death for this sermon, it, it centers around this idea that you rejected the prophets. You kept rejecting them over and over and over again. Don't you see that now you've actually rejected what the prophets were prophesying about? You rejected him too. And so uh, then they stoned him. They didn't like that. Um, we talked about, I talked about a couple of facts. One of the main ones that I want us to sink in is that the halal in Jewish culture, that's Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, they would sing these songs, the, I mean, it's got a name for them, the halal, and they sing them specifically at Passover, during the week of Passover. So, as we are in chapter 21, uh, Jesus initiates the uh, Lord's Supper, And he says that this meal is actually about me. They sing a hymn, and then they go to the uh, Mount of Olives. So presumably, this is the last hymn they sang at Passover, which is Psalm 118. It's the last hymn of the halal. It's what you would have sang last. And so it's kind of a cool thing to think about that right before Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have 
sang this chapter that we're studying. Most people believe that. Then we talked about verses 1 through 4, and we talked about this idea of there's a narrowing that's going on there, um, all the way down from God choosing Israel, and then he chooses out of all the nations of the world, and then he chooses one tribe to be priests out of that nation, and then he chooses people who fear the Lord out of those people who are even priests, because there were a lot of priests who didn't fear God. And so there's this narrowing, not a widening, that God is talking about. He was saying, basically, even the best of the best of the best of the best need mercy. That's what I think 1 through 4 is saying. And then we talked about one through, or 5 through 7. Um, we looked at Jesus calling out in distress in the garden while he was sweating uh, drops of blood. And uh, we talked about why he was in distress. Um, and we talked a little bit about the cup when Jesus said, am I going to drink the cup that my father gave me? We talked about what that meant. Um, we looked at how Jesus didn't fear anyone but God. Um, even when he was put on public trial and condemned, he didn't fear the people condemning him at all, Pilate. Um, we talked about the desire that, that Jesus had, talking about, therefore I shall see my desire on those who hate me. We talked about what Jesus said about people who hate you. And what did he say? <laughs> he said, um, bless those who curse you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. So it kind of flips it on its head. And the Jews were thinking, oh yeah, the Messiah is going to come and like, do some damage. And then, and then they didn't like Jesus because he said, love your enemies. <laughs> do good to those who hate you. They didn't like that. So now, we're all caught up. Let's go on to verse 8. Talk about verse 8 and 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Now, a lot of things that I read about this chapter, does this apply to us individually today? Totally, yes. Absolutely it does. But before I, want, before I talk about how it applies to us, I want to focus on how Jesus would have read this psalm. You know, Jesus read these psalms too, <laughs> right? It's not just we're reading them. How did Jesus think about this when he was reading about himself? And that's what I want to talk about. Um, there's two different focuses in these two verses, and I want to... Uh, it's this idea of, I want to talk about the word trust, because it's in both of these verses. Um, trust or put confidence in. It's this idea of safety. It's this idea of security, that um, you feel safe doing what they're telling you to do. For instance, if my kids are jumping on the bed, and I say, kids, stop jumping on the bed. You're going to get hurt, <laughs> right? And... If they trust me, they'll stop. If they don't trust me, then hopefully they just get, just get hurt enough that they'll listen to me the next time, right? <laughs> Anybody has kids? I'm just kidding. I'm not going to torture my kids, guys. It's, it's fine. But that's the idea of trust. It's not just something that happens in your head. It's something, it's an action. When you trust somebody, it's something you do. Um, it it's, it's kind of goes along almost with faith, right? When you're, when you're watching the Weather Channel, and the weatherman says, there's a tornado heading for your house. Well, if you trust him, you will get up and leave. If you have faith that what he said is true, you'll get up and leave, find some safety. If you don't, then you won't move. So your faith and your actions and your trust and your actions, they go hand in hand. They're not separate. It's, your actions are proof of what you trust and what you put your faith in. So, you're relying on them for what they tell you. Um, trust is not an action, but, or it's not just an idea that happens in your mind, but an action that plays out in your life. Let's talk about the idea of trusting in princes. There we go again. Like, God's bringing in government again, right? And as Americans, we're like, hey, church and state, man, don't talk about it. Well, the Bible talks about it, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about it. 
um, princes is a government idea. This is called monarchy, right? And so in our case, we live in America. We live in a republic. We, we elect our leaders. We elect our president. Um, but the principle here still stands. Um, princes and, and the government over you is still the same idea. Whether we're talking about princes that dictate things or uh, presidents that, after we vote them in, start uh, passing laws and, and doing things like that. Like, uh, our, the princes, they would lead their armies to conquer new territory and protect the territory that they already have. Well, our president is the commander-in-chief. Doesn't he essentially do the same thing? So this idea of princes, I think it's just the overall, your government, you're trusting in the earthly government that's over you. And it's saying that it's better to rely on God than it is a man or the government that's over you. I'm not, hear me out. I'm, I'm not a rebel here, for the most part. So let's look at Jesus. Did he put trust in God over man? Did he fulfill this verse in his life? Is this part of his character? Let me put one example up here. Do you remember, uh, from, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day, or be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, which is adversary. He's not calling him the devil. Satan sometimes can be translated. You're just, you're against what I'm trying to do. You're, you're an adversary. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So even Peter, um, who Jesus said, you were going to be the rock. You're Peter. Peter means rock, right? I'm going to build my church on you. He's a close friend, one of the three, Peter, James, John, one of his closest disciples, and he rebukes him. You know, and which means that God cared, Jesus cared more about what God had going on than how Peter and his relationship was. This is an example of Jesus putting God before people, even people that he loved. So, did Jesus ever put trust in God over his ruling government? Um, he was in a theocracy. They, were in a, they didn't have princes. They, uh, their government was their religion. So, did he, did he put trust in God over the government? Totally. Yes. Yes, he did. Um, did you notice how many times Jesus decided to do things on the Sabbath? You ever thought about that? Um, look at this. I'm going to read a couple things. The first thing Jesus did, I put a, just kind of a few, there's a lot more examples than this, but for time's sake, I just put a few up there. The first thing after he did when he got back from 40 days fasting in the desert, Jesus goes to his hometown, Nazareth, where everyone knows who he is, even all the way from when he was a kid. And on the Sabbath day, the Jews would take turns, they would, they would take out the Torah and they would read a passage. Well, when they got up this Sabbath, it was Jesus' turn to read. So Jesus got up and he reads this prophecy about from Isaiah 61 about a uh, you know I probably should have written it down but um then he, he reads what is it the Yeah the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and something about captives to free the captives and then he says rolls up the scroll walks over to his seat Sits down, and everybody's like looking at him, because that's a weird thing to do. And he said, today, this was fulfilled. I just fulfilled this. <laughs> that's crazy, right? And what they did um, was they got very angry, and they brought him up to a cliff and tried to kill him. And he walked right through the midst of them and walked away. Do you think Jesus knew that that would make them mad and that they thought it would be blasphemy? Totally. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> he did it on purpose. Matthew 12, Jesus and his disciples were walking along the way, and his disciples got hungry. They started plucking grains 
of wheat to eat. And the Pharisees looked at him and said, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. It's against the law. Right? The government. You ha we have to keep reminding ourselves that they lived in a theocracy. When they said that that was against the law, we think the Old Testament law is just religious. And as Americans, that's what it is to us. To the Jews 2,000 years ago, that was their government. That was their law. And so they said they're not doing what's lawful to do on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus used this to show how, hip, how much uh, hypocrisy they had in their lives. And right after that, where were they walking? They were walking to the synagogue of that same town. And they asked him, they were trying to trap him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They were trying to trap him, do a work. Do a work on the Sabbath and break the law of Moses. Do it so that we know you're not of God. Right? That's what they were thinking. So Jesus, again, he, he uses their question to show their hypocrisy of, hey, even you who, who have a sheep that would fall into a gutter, you would reach in and pull him out. And it was easier for Jesus to heal this man of a withered hand than it was for them to pull a sheep out of a gutter. And they judged Jesus for that. So it was, it was a showing thing. They didn't really care about the law. They didn't really care about that. They cared about their status. Right? And Jesus, Jesus was showing that over and over again. And how he showed that was to help the poor. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Help the man with a withered hand. You see, the, the idea that the Jews had about the Sabbath became twisted some way or another. Um, they took, they took, they looked at the letter of the law, don't do any work on the Sabbath day, right? Don't do any work. And they turned it, what was meant to be a blessing, and they twisted the law and made it a burden on people. A burden to which they themselves could not follow. <laughs> so it's just hypocrites all over the place. Um, so there's this idea of laws in that time being being twisted for selfish purposes, and Jesus cut through that. And it wasn't just religious purposes. These were political purposes. This is a theocracy. They cared about honor. They cared about being esteemed and being lifted and above the sinners. I'm not like those people. And Jesus says, yes, you are. <laughs> you need mercy, right? Verses 1 through 4. And so... Jesus could have picked a different day to do these things. He could have. He could have just gone along and said, I'm not going to really offend the governing bodies. I'm not going to offend the Pharisees, the Sadducees. I'm just going to leave them. You know, I'm not going to rock the boat. But rather, Jesus decided to trust and obey God rather than any man or the governing body over him. Even if it went with the major against what the majority of people were living like, He, he did what God wanted him to do. He was focused. He had a mission. He didn't listen to his government and be a good person, right, in the culture. Um, he was worried about what God thought about him. And I think there's a lesson there, right? Let's keep our minds like that, too. So even, even though this psalm can be about us, too. You know, we don't, have to, we don't have to put our confidence in governments. We put our confidence in our king. We're a part of a government, the kingdom of God, and we have a king. We put our confidence in him. We trust him. When he tells us to do it, do this or that, um, if the government were to tell us something in contrary, who do we listen to? We listen to our king. That's us putting our trust in, our, uh, in God over our princes. Um... And, and as, you, as you do your own personal studies, go through the Gospels and see how many times Jesus would do something that was against the culture that they thought was against the law, and he did it on purpose over and over and over and over and over again, all the time. It was part of his ministry. Think about how many times he claimed to be the Son of God. You know, that's, a, that's blasphemy, right? That's against the law of, of the Jewish law. And yet, it didn't stop Jesus from saying, I am the son of God. <laughs> he, he was afraid of God more than he was their government.
He knew he was in danger of, of prosecu- prosecution, literally a, before a judge, prosecution, when he'd said these things, and he'd said them anyways. He was teaching those things anyways. Um, let's keep going. Verses 10. We're going to look at verses 10, 11, and 12. All nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Now, that's not doesn't sound warm and fuzzy, does it? Like, Jesus, Jesus loves us. What? <laughs> but he's going to destroy all the nations? Well, for one... This person in this in the psalm is going to destroy all the nations. One, David never did that. He didn't destroy. I can't think of any person in history that destroyed all nations, <laughs> right? We would remember that. <laughs> There's nobody that's done that, right? Um, not in the physical sense, for sure. But that doesn't mean that it can't be in a very literal sense. Just because you don't destroy something in a physical sense doesn't mean that you can't literally destroy something, especially when it's a government. So think about this, nation, a nation or a government. How you doing? We were going to wait for you, but (laughs) peer pressure, you know. You may be thinking, Jesus didn't destroy all the nations. Um, He didn't destroy any nation, right? He didn't destroy them. He died for them. But I want us to think a little bit deeper about this idea. Um, Is there any other prophecy that speaks about the Messiah coming and destroying nations? Is this the only place that we read this in the Scriptures? Or is there other places that talk about the Messiah destroying nations? Do you guys remember what we talked about in Daniel 2? Let's read this snippet. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? There was a statue. You watched while the stone that was cut without hands struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. He interpreted the dream in like this. 44? Okay, here we go. And in the days of these kings, God's... So we're skipping down a little bit to to the interpretation in this chapter. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that stone that was cut uh, cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. So here's another idea that obviously it's the Messiah that is this stone that comes. And we talked about um, what that mountain was. You remember that? The video we watched of all these people singing? So, if you read this, you may be thinking what the Jews were thinking at the time, in the day. They may have been thinking, well, we're waiting for a Messiah to come and destroy Rome. We're waiting for the Messiah to come and destroy all these nations. The Jews now are still waiting for a Messiah to come and destroy everything, all the nations, and rule, and reign. They're waiting for this person. They just don't realize what I'm telling you guys tonight. They don't realize it yet. Hopefully they will. Many more Jews are starting to realize it more and more. But um, I want us to think about something here. I believe I touched on this when I talked about Daniel 2, when we actually went over this chapter. But so you might think that Jesus figuratively destroyed these nations, like in a figurative way. Not really, just, just kind of, not really. But that's not what I'm claiming. That's not what I'm saying here. I don't think that's the case. I think it's literal. Um, not, in a, not in a physical sense, as in he bombed them and destroyed all the nations, but 
we need to think, what is a nation? What is a kingdom? Is it land? Is it buildings? No, it's not. It's a group of people that come together in its very simplest form that all follow the same laws. So kingdoms are centered around everybody's following the same laws. In America, we vote on that. In a theocracy, or in a monarchy, the king dictates what those laws are. Which, by the way, if we're in the kingdom of God, that's what we're in. The king dictates to us what we do. We're servants. We don't vote. <laughs> Can't be a Christian American in that sense. <laughs> we, we, we don't say, look, God, more than, you know, 51% of the nation says that we should live like this. Anyways, so a nation, a kingdom is all based on laws. Um, a nation could have a lot of land or a very small amount of land, but it doesn't matter about the, the, the physicalness of it. What matters is, is, is the laws that their leadership puts forth and everybody that's in that follows those laws. Um, in the case of the kingdom of heaven, there is no land or boundary at all. Remember what we studied in Isaiah 9. We touched on this when we talked about the birth of the Messiah and all the prophecies surrounding that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, it's going to keep expanding, the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. There is no land boundary. There is no boundary to the kingdom of God. So, when we went over Daniel 2, I showed a video of all of these people singing uh, Amazing Grace in all of their different languages from all around the world. It was a really beautiful video. You should go on YouTube and check it out. But one person in particular stuck out to me. One person in all of those things. And it's this man. I had to go take a screenshot of it. From Wuhan, China. Why do you suppose his face is blurred out? Hmm? Safety. Yeah, that's right. Because the Chinese government doesn't like it when people put Jesus Christ in a position of authority over their laws of their nation. Right? So, in order to protect himself and probably his congregation, he didn't want his identity to be shown. So, think about it. This man chooses to follow the laws of the Messiah, King Jesus, instead of China, which makes this man a part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He's following those laws. He's following the, <laughs> that kingdom's laws, not China's laws. He's breaking the law here. You realize that, right? So here in America, we're really blessed to have freedom to worship how we see fit. But if there ever comes a time that our government would make us choose between following the teachings of Jesus or some law that goes against the teachings of Jesus, I pray that we're like this man. And our loyalties still lie with King Jesus. Luckily, we haven't been put in a position like that yet. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I don't know. It's not for me to say. All I can say is that we should have the loyalties. Where, where do our loyalty, loyalties lie and what are we prepared to do? You see, in this man's heart, this, this man from Wuhan, and in, in our hearts as well, whether you realize it or not, all the laws that were created by a man-made government of this world have started to take a back seat in your life. We don't study the Constitution like we do the Bible. We don't put them on the same page, on the same level. If the laws of our earthly government, nation, coincide with the laws of King Jesus, then yes, okay, well, gladly, we're going to follow them. Um, that's what it means. Like, God, we want your will on earth as it is in heaven. And thank God, like, America is based on Judeo-Christianity, right? We based our laws off of that. Thank God we did. Um, but that's what it means. If we can pass laws that are, are godly, then that's great, and we should follow them. All I'm saying is, if, it ever, if those laws are ever twisted and turned into opposition like the Pharisees did, the law that was literally given by God, 
that was even twisted. Our government wasn't given by the mouth of God. Theirs were, and they twisted that. So if our laws ever become twisted in a way that, that opposes Christ, then we need to understand that our loyalty is with Christ Jesus, our King, because it is a government. So in a very real, in a physical way, in the hearts of everyone who believes, the nation in which they live have, has become destroyed. <laughs> Do you see that? Because the laws of King Jesus trump the laws that we live in. We're just ambassadors here. In a very real sense, it's destroyed the nation <laughs> that we live in because we don't follow the laws. We follow His laws. You see, Paul himself, although he said, and a lot of people like to bring this up, and it's, and it's true, submit to your governing authorities, right? Absolutely, yes. Paul himself did that. He submitted to the laws of the land at the time. But one of those laws became to stop spreading the gospel of Christ, right? We get that. They started putting people, Christians in prison. But when, but when the government threw Paul in prison, he submitted. He submitted to his governing authorities. He didn't go out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a bunch of people and start a rebellion and fight for my rights. He didn't do that. He submitted to the laws. That doesn't mean he obeyed them. Because <laughs> they were saying, don't spread the gospel. And he was spreading the gospel. It didn't stop him. So, um, thank God we're not in that position right now in America. That's great. If it ever does get that way, I hope we have the faith of this man. I hope we have the faith of Paul that we're going to obey King Jesus before we do any president, any, any government. And what's the worst thing they can do? What's the worst thing any government can do? I'd say take your life. They could throw you in jail. They could take your life. There's not much more you can take than a person's life. Well, let's fear the person who can give life instead of only people who can take it from you. Because you see, guys, we're going to resurrect one day. We're going to live again. We may die, but we're not going to stay dead. Governments can kill you, but they cannot resurrect you. <laughs> so fear God over anything else, over anybody else, man or government. Fear God because he has the, he has the power and the ability to raise you from the dead. Let's keep going. Look what Jesus said in John 18. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should be delivered to not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And if you remember, in the garden, Peter tried to fight for him. In the garden, you guys remember that? John 18, not much, I mean, it's the same chapter. These, <laughs> then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father's given me? So he did have followers willing to physically fight for him, and that's not what Jesus wanted. That's significant. Um, where he said, hey, my kingdom was of this world, he could have very well led a rebellion and tried to take over Rome like a lot of other people did. He didn't do that. He chose martyrdom. He chose to die for us. <laughs> he chose to die for the people that hated him and was putting him to death. So what kind of fighting did Jesus want us to do? Check it out. Right before he went into heaven, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority, all authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations. All nations surrounded me. He's saying go to all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you to do. Teach them to follow my teachings, my laws. Let me be their king. And 
And if you've ever thought about... Anyways. This is how the kingdom of heaven was to conquer all the nations of the world. And in a very real way, destroyed any law that a man-made made government or a man-made law would make without one single weapon. No bombs, not even a knife. He conquered. Um, because now we observe all the things that Jesus commanded his disciples to do. Because that's what they taught us to do. Oh, the second thing I want to point out in verse 12. It's the idea is that the nations were quenched like a fire of thorns. That was kind of a foreign idea to me. That was kind of a, it's kind of a weird sentence to me as an American in 2023, 2024. But when I looked it up, apparently in the Eastern world, uh, when people were clearing land to either farm on or build a building on or something like that, um, if there were a lot of thorns or weeds on the land, uh, the person would wait for the dry season and burn it all. They just catch fire. It's really hard to remove thorn bushes by hand, um, but if they catch on fire, they burn up quick, like that. They burn fast, and then they die out. Um, so I believe what this idea is saying, that they were quenched, the nations were quenched like fire on thorns, is this idea of uh, the nations would be overtaken quickly, like it happened fast. Um, from what I believe and what I've put forth as what destroy means or convert, I think it means convert people to King Jesus' laws as opposed to the laws of their nation, destroying that nation in that way. Um, I, I think this is saying the nations would be converted quickly or their loyalty would change quickly and become part of the kingdom of God. Um, so I want to show you a short video. It's about a minute, minute long that tracks the spread of Christianity. And I want to show you guys just how fast Christianity spread. Five hundred years right here. So, Penn State University, Utah State, coll different colleges. Um, let's see, where am I here? I don't know how exact that model is. I don't know how absolutely precise it is. But even if it's close, <laughs> um, which those are, you know, pretty strong sources, it's a powerful testimony of just how quick and widespread the message of Jesus spread. Um, how quickly. Think about this. Um, Judaism, in the first, what, 4,000 years before Jesus came? How, how widespread was that? Who was a Jew? Like, what, what you know, uh, the Jew religion 
the, the mosaic, you know, Moses' laws and that kind of stuff, they didn't spread like wildfire across the world like that. But yet, in 2,000 years, just 2,000, as opposed to what, four? In half the time, it's literally spread to every single nation, the message of Jesus. And there is, let's see, I have the number here. If I can figure out where I'm at. 2.3 billion people claim to follow Jesus. That's what the stats are that I looked up. Who knows how, you know, people are converted every day. People are saying they're Christians, they're not. But people who claim it, 2.3 billion. That's crazy. That's a lot. I think there's 8 billion people in the world. One-fourth, over a fourth of the people of the world claim to follow Jesus. That is like spreading wildfire like thorns. I mean, it happened fast. So, let's keep going. 13. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but has not given me over to death. And again, I want, us to, I want to remind us, the Lord is our salvation. Absolutely He is. But can you think of what Jesus was thinking when He read this? This psalm here? The halal, He's singing this literally moments before He goes to the garden to, to be arrested and start getting beat all night, whipped, crucified the next morning. He's thinking, I, I guarantee Jesus was thinking that this was about him. Do you see the contrast here in this group of verses, though? Um, he's become my salvation, but the Lord chastened me. The Lord is the salvation and the one that is chastising this person in the psalm. Huh? It's revealing. Oh, yeah, severe. Well, it is revealing. But severely chastened, yeah. That bad whooping. <laughs> but it didn't give him over to death. The Lord didn't give this person over to death. Let's look at Isaiah 53. This is another messianic prophecy we're going we're gonna to study pretty soon here. Um, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is talking about the Lord. It made God happy to kill Jesus. It pleased Him. It made Him happy to do so. Let's look at another one. Psalm 22. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. This is another prophecy about how the, how the Messiah would die. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, which is this idea of God made us from dust and from dust will return. Somebody would say the dust of death, talk about your di- you're dying. You're going to die. Um, Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. This is the turning point in the psalm. You've answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. I mean, Jesus himself said to his disciples over and over and over and over again, I'm going to be rejected by the Jews and killed. Right? I mean, he said it. Plenty of times. It was kind of a part of his thing, especially with his close disciples. I don't think he ever said it publicly. Am I wrong about that, Dad? Did he just come out and say, I'm, I'm going to be Jay? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I mean, think about this. Jesus himself could have spoken these words in, in verse 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And the idea that the Messiah would be punished by the Lord for the sake of our sin and not his own sin, is consistent, not only in the New Testament, like Jews want to say that that's a New Testament idea of Christians, we tried to put it on the text. This is an Old Testament idea. This came from all the way to the Old Testament. This isn't new. <laughs> so one commentary I read had a problem with the phrase, I shall not die but live. 
claiming that this couldn't be about Jesus because Jesus died, right? This couldn't be about Jesus because this says, I won't die. Well, I got a couple problems with that idea. And it, not a problem, yeah, it's a problem. Here's, here's my argument. This is what I think about. One, if this isn't about Jesus, who else in history can claim that they didn't die? If, and if, it's, if this person is referring to, I won't die but live, meaning the resurrection, like one day I'll be resurrected, then why could this not apply to Jesus? Jesus was the first to resurrect. I mean, why? So that doesn't make sense to me. Um, it would apply more to Jesus than it would any of us as of right now. Um, two, when Isaiah said it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to bruise him, if you read it that literally and said, well, look, it said bruise, God didn't say he was going to kill him. I mean, it's like you have to read the, the, the God's word with some kind of uh, discernment here. Um, Jesus wasn't just bruised, he was tortured and killed. Um, but the context in Isaiah 52, and I think the context in 118, the only conclusion we can possibly have is that this is a talk, talking about the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Um, I think this is why the verse 18 emphasizes, the Lord has not given me over to death. He didn't just leave me dead. Um, he, meaning he, he died, but he didn't stay dead. Um, also, I won't get into this tonight too much because I'll get into it when we study Isaiah 53, but this idea of the hand of the Lord, it is a phrase that talks about um, God doing powerful, amazing things, but I think, I truly think, and I'll make a case for this, um, that ultimately it's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. Um, but did Jesus part the Red Sea? We'll talk about it. Um, I'll make a case for that later. Let's keep going. Verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them. I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Does Jesus ever refer to himself as a gate? Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, no, he did, he did. Turn to John 10, or I'll have it up here. You don't have to turn. You know how I do. I'm going to throw it up there for you. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold, by the door, or the gate, it's the same word, it's just translated in English two different ways, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, meaning the shepherd's going to walk through the door first. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus walked through the doors of righteousness when we couldn't walk through them. He did it first. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, us, the sheep, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings, uh, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but, but will flee from him, for they do not know the stranger's voice. Jesus used this illustration, but they didn't understand it. So, he made it clear, like he does a lot with his disciples. He's like, all right, you guys still don't get this? All right, here we go. Here it is. This is what I meant. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All... Whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, and sheep didn't hear them. I am the door. If anyone hears, enters by me, or by, and I'll talk about that, if anybody enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have, may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus is saying, I, I am the door here. And now, Jesus would do this a lot. He would take Old Testament messianic things like uh, the good shepherd. That's a, that's a messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Um, Jesus multiple times, well, in, all the, in a lot of, I think it's all the Gospels, he said, I am the good shepherd. 
I am that good shepherd. And I think he's doing the same idea here by saying, I am the gate. I am the gate. And this word by, let's talk about that for just a second. Um, in the Greek, it means dia, dia. Um, this word could also be, also be translated through, through. And I think we get that when we read the passage, but I think it's important to emphasize it. Um, it's the idea of going through something, uh, whether, whether it's a place or a physical thing, but go through. And Jesus also used the same idea and word in John 14. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only through Christ can we get there, like a gate, like a, like a, like a door. We have to go through him. Jesus saw that the Messiah would have to be a type of gateway for people to go through in order for them to become a part of the flock or a part of the kingdom of God. This is not a new idea. It was an old one. Um, this phrase, have become my salvation, in your own studies, uh, I, won't, I won't harp on this, but go look at Exodus 15. If you've got notes, jot it down. Exodus 15. Read Psalm 118 and then read Exodus 15. There, Moses, right after the Israelites went through the Red Sea um, and, the, and the sea closed and killed all of the Egyptian army, Moses wrote a song and he sang a song there. Read that song and read this psalm side by side. It's really weird how similar they are. It's really cool. Not, not word for word, but they have some of the same themes. And one of the repeated phrases that Moses would say is that, uh, and you have become my salvation. It's this idea of becoming salvation. All right, let's go to verses 22 through 26. The famous, most quoted part of this chapter. Everybody knows this one. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the reason why we started looking at this psalm in the first place, because Jesus said, that was me, right? This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray. O Lord, O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So there's two things here. Um, this is quoted in where we are in Matthew, using it as a roadmap. We're in chapter 21. Um, this psalm is quoted twice, and I know I said that the first time I taught, but it's good to emphasize it. One at the beginning of that chapter, close to the beginning, and one towards the end, Jesus himself. At the beginning, Jesus rides in on a donkey, and everybody's shouting these messianic titles, Son of David, Son of David. And then one of the titles that they say is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting this psalm which means they thought of this psalm as messianic. They were saying, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is my king. Hosanna, Jesus is my king. And then Jesus himself later says, the stone that the builders rejected. That's me. Let's talk about what a cornerstone is. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard this. You're a lot older than me, and you're probably a lot wiser than me. But let's talk about it anyways. A cornerstone is the first stone that was to be laid in the building of a building, a home or anything else. It was the first stone that you would lay down. Um, it's important because this stone would dictate the shape of the building. If it wasn't square, the building wouldn't be square. Um, if it was a little wonky, the building would be a little wonky. Uh, you're basing all the walls off of that stone. Um, so you want that stone to be nice and square. Um, so that when, it, when, when the walls meet up on the opposite corner, they actually make a 45 degree. They, they look, you know, did it the right way. It's a powerful picture that God's made here. Um, let's look at Ephesians 2. Paul talks about this, the cornerstone. And I think he's talking about not only the teaching that Jesus said, I am, the corner, I am this cornerstone, but I think he's talking about this chapter 2, 118. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 
having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, after Jesus, before Jesus, prophets before, apostles after, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We're being built for a temple of the Holy Spirit here. And even though we may not be on the bottom level, we're one of those stones. We're all one of those stones. So, this is another way of saying, you could also say it this way, everything in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. It's all about the Messiah. Everything is built based on what He would come and do. We're looking back on it now. The apostles looked back on it, and the, and the prophets were looking forward to it. But it all accumulates with Him, the cornerstone, things being built away from Him. So think about this. What does it mean when a builder of a house rejects a, start, a certain stone and doesn't want that stone to be the cornerstone of what he's building? What, what's the implication there? Well, it means he doesn't like the shape of that stone. <laughs> he didn't like the shape of it. I don't want my house to be that shape. I'm going to find a different stone. Because you build your house around that stone. And when this passage said, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes, this is the Lord's doing, this means that, it, that God liked the shape of the cornerstone. What he was building God saw it as marvelous, where the leaders of, of the Jews, they didn't see it as marvelous. Right? God chose him when the Jews rejected him. Um, they wanted the Messiah to come and conquer Rome and free the Jews and their occupation. Um, they did not like what Jesus was coming to teach. Love your enemies? I don't like the shape of that house. I want you to destroy Rome. Let's go to Samaria. Maybe we can call down fire from heaven and destroy everybody. Right? Like the Old Testament prophets. And he goes, hold on now, sons of thunder. Chill, chill. It was this idea that the Messiah, you know, was rejected because they didn't realize the, the shape of the house that God was going to build. And they didn't like it when they realized what was happening. They didn't like it. So, why is this marvelous in our eyes? which is that last phrase that Jesus was saying or the, in, in 23. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Think about this. This is something I've said before, and I'm quoting somebody. I didn't make this up. I, I don't know who I'm quoting. It's been so long, I don't remember who it was. But think about this. Think about being in front of Jesus 2,000 years ago while he's hanging on a cross. And he's being killed between two convicted sinners... The most holy people in your society, the people you're supposed to be looking up to and trying to emulate, rejected him and want him killed in a very brutal way. And everyone is saying it's because of something he did. If he's innocent, let God save him. God would save him if he's innocent. If someone were to say to you that in 2,000 years, this man would be the world's most famous Jew... We will count the years of our calendars based on before and after his death. And entire nations would be, uh, <laughs> would be based on laws based off of the principles he taught. And because of him, people from every single nation, from all around the world, will turn and worship Yahweh, the God of the Jews. You would think that person was crazy. It's the most unlikely scenario that could ever happen. But that's exactly what happened. And it's marvelous. It was marvelous. It is marvelous. Let's keep going. Last, last little stint here. God is the Lord, and He has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Going all the way back to the beginning. The first phrase 
This uh, verse 21, it's just a declaration that God is Yahweh. Remember when, when the translators put L-O-R-D all in capital letters? That's God's name. Um, it's not just a random Lord or a random person. So this is saying, God is the God of the Jews. God is Yahweh. He's the right God. In this particular time, it's called Jehovah, Jehovah, in this passage. So, let's talk about God has given us light. I want to read a few passages from the book of John. And I think after we read these passages, you'll agree with me that it's reasonable to think that the New Testament authors and Jesus himself recognized that he was this light that was to come into the world, that God has given us light. The beginning of John, the very beginning of John. I won't read the whole thing because we're getting short on time. But look at how many times John emphasizes that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus comes into the world, and he's the light of men. John, he bore witness about the light, but he himself wasn't the light, right? That's because the Messiah was the light. Um, He's the true light, which gives light to every man. (laughs) I mean, it's like overkill, right? I think they're trying to make a point. And then look at John 3. 3.16, like the most famous verse in all of the world, right? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. But later, that's all everybody ever quotes. In 19, look at verse 19 down there. And this is the condemnation. He's saying everyone who believes is not condemned. Okay, I'll start at 18. He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. This is what the condemnation is. That the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light. Again, John calling Jesus the light. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, comes to Jesus. They come to Jesus that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they've been done in God. And then a few more. And I just kind of put them all on the same slide here. Jesus spoke to them again in John 8. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 9. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. John 12. Then Jesus said to him, a little while longer the light is with you. A little while longer I am with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. But while you have the light, while you have me, believe in me, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. And then you skip down to verse uh, 46 of chapter 12. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. I felt necessary. It felt it was necessary to read all of those passages. I know that's a lot, you know, of different places that we're jumping around to. But I wanted you to know that I didn't just find the word light somewhere in the Old Testament, find the word light somewhere in the New Testament, and say, well, you know, let's just smash them together. No, the idea that Jesus referred to himself as a light of the world was consistent and often throughout his ministry. This isn't just a one-off. Um, he did it often. And not only did Jesus refer to himself often as the light, his disciples called him the light while they were writing the Gospels. So I don't think it's far-fetched that Jesus would have read this psalm and on his mind while he was singing the halal and say, God has given us light and not see himself as that light. I think it's reasonable. Let's keep going. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Does anybody know which altar in in Leviticus, when they were building all of this stuff, is the only altar that has horns? Anybody know? How about one of you does? Yeah. It was the burnt, it was the altar of burnt offering. Right? Um, So there are five different burnt offerings. There was this one. 
It was before you, it was in the courtyard, it was before you would go into the Holy of Holies, and even before you go into the holy, holiest of holies, in the, where the Ark of the Covenant was. But you'd have to sacrifice here, and then wash in the basin before you could go in. And there were five different sacrifices that God told them to sacrifice here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I, I put a general kind of what they were about here. It, it, it's in Leviticus 1 through chapter, chapter 1 through chapter 27. And it lays out pretty much exactly what these sacrifices are called and what they're for. But a burnt offering, the grain offering, a peace offering, a sin offering, and a guilt offering. Those are the five sacrifices that God commands them to burn on this burnt altar, the one with horns. Um, and all of these are for different things, you know, uh, general devotion, to recognize God's providence with the grain. A peace offering was the idea of having peace between another person, between God. So you would sacrifice an animal to consecrate that. Um, sin offering, um, sometimes, it, I mean, it was unintentional sin. It's also sometimes viewed as a, as a mix between a guilt offering and a peace offering. Sometimes those are together, and they called that the sin offering. Contained elements of both. Um, the, the primary purpose of that one was to re-enter the, the presence of God, was the sin offering there. Guilt offering, it, it's not like the, the English word guilt. It doesn't really have to do with your conscience. Rather, it's, it's someone who owns an account of a sin. That sin was on you. Now, whether you feel guilty or not, you're, the guilt remains on you. That's the idea, is to get rid of that guilt. Um, Let's see what the writer of Hebrew has to say about these sacrifices. Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually every year, year by year, make those who approach perfect. They don't make them perfect. For then, would they, uh, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more conscience, consciousness of sin. So he's saying this is what the purpose of these sacrifices were. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. It's to remind you of your sin. Don't forget you're a sinner. That's what the sacrificial system was for. Not to cleanse your sin, but to remind you you are a sinner. That's what it was for. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. It's not possible. Only the blood of Jesus can take away sin. We understand now that the sacrifice that Jesus gave with his own life is the fulfillment of these sacrifices. The only reason God told them to uh, focus on these things is because this is what the Messiah would come to, to overcome in our lives. Um, the Levitical sacrifices, they were just a shadow of the things to come. They weren't the thing itself. It wasn't the image itself that's casting the shadow. The thing casting the shadow was Jesus himself, the Messiah. Yes, it was symbolic. And it was, like, it was more than symbolic. Like it, was, uh, it, was, it was symbolic and predictive. It was like prophetic in, a, in its nature. It's the, own, the, the Levitical system was all pointing towards this coming Messiah, whether they knew it or not at the time. And the Hebrews saying if they did know that this didn't cleanse their sin, they wouldn't do it. They would, they would stop doing it. But yet God wanted them to do it year after year to remind them of their sin. Yeah, Jesus became the sacrifice for all of these things combined. And it's only His blood that we can truly be thankful, devoted, at peace with God, at peace with man, sinless, guiltless. It's only through Jesus' sacrifice. And His sacrifice covered all the way back to Abraham. And that's covered. Paul talks about that in, in, in Romans, that uh, Abraham was justified by his faith in the coming Messiah. So it was always Jesus, even in the Old Testament. I didn't get that growing up. I always thought that it was after No, nope, these were physical. With the burnt offering, you would bring a, a lamb, 
uh, one year old without blemish. Grain offerings, you'd bring the first fruits of your grain. It was all physical, and you would burn it on that altar with horns. Um, you would burn all of these. You would keep a portion of it for uh, the Levitical priests, and they could eat it. They could sell the pelts to have money. Um, but yeah, these are all physical. Mm-hmm. And the psalm ends the way it begins. Um, to the Lord, because his mer- <laughs> give thanks to the Lord because his mercy endures forever. I believe this phrase encapsulates the entire chapter of this psalm. Uh, why is God good? Why is he merciful? Because God made a way for us to come back. He restored us into relationship with, God, with our God. He gave us boldness. He gave us someone to trust in. He gave us a king that has done what no other king has done by conquering all the other nations of the world by his teachings. He gave us light in this world so that we didn't have to stumble in darkness. He gave us his son as a sacrifice for the sake of our atonement so that we could have a relationship with the Father again. He gave us proof of his, of his son's divinity by raising him from the dead. This is why we should give thanks to Him. And this is why his, He is so good. And this is what makes Him merciful. This is what His mercy is. It is the Messiah. The accumulation of all of God's mercy is Jesus Christ. Thank God it lasts forever. <laughs> right? So this is my closing thoughts on the whole chapter. I know it was long. You guys have been troopers. Now that I've made my case for this whole chapter being about the Christ, or about the Messiah, it's important for you to know that there are people out there who have written commentaries that are way smarter than me, more, way more educated than me, that absolutely do not believe that this entire psalm is about Jesus. Only parts of it. And they're not no names. They're, I've, I've read them before. I've looked, at, looked up to them. I, re- I read their commentaries. So just know that that's out there. If you go and find commentaries on this, uh, I found a couple of things. That was one of them that said, there is no way this, is, this entire chapter is all about Christ. I hope I made a good case that I think it is. I absolutely think it is. Um, I'm not claiming to be the smartest man in the world. Uh, but this is just what I see. When I read through that chapter, I can't help but see Jesus everywhere. Especially the fact that he's singing it right before he fulfills it. Um, If, if I come to find out that I'm wrong, I will come up here, and I will tell you why. And I will tell you that I'm wrong. I promise. And if anybody else has a good argument against what I'm saying, like please don't hesitate uh, to talk to me about it. Um, email me if, if, you, if you feel uncomfortable talking to me face-to-face. I, I'm not combative. We're all just trying to find the truth here. Um, so let's strengthen each other. I hope that... that uh, I've taught you what, it, what is true. I think I did in this chapter. I think it is about the Messiah. This is why we study, you know. Some other things that I read in commentaries, they wouldn't, they wouldn't address that this was uh, a prophetic at all. Uh, they, would talk that, they would say that this is about, like I said before, a person, just a random person that this happened to, or David himself that this happened to. And... It, Every time I hear a sermon, because I listened to about, about four or five different preachers preach on this chapter before I, while I was studying it, and I didn't listen to them all the way through because it, it tended to turn out to be this idea of like using this chapter as a self-help book. It's like almost using this chapter to, chapter to help us in our Christian walk, which is not wrong. Like It's, it's not bad to do that, um, but... but <laughs> It cuts out the idea that Jesus did it first. <laughs> Jesus did all of these things perfectly. Uh, so let's not ever find ourselves lowering a passage of Scripture from divine prophecy to a mere self-help book. Because as, even if we could have a million self-help books and we're never going to be perfect, we're always going to need mercy. We're always going to need Christ and His sacrifice. So... Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't look at these chapters. Let, us, let them inspire us to live more holy lives. Uh, but just don't forget that when you read these things, you're ultimately looking deeper into the character of God and into the person of Jesus and letting that 
produce a genuine belief and faith in Him, and that will produce works in your life. We don't need to try to read this and then uh, go live by that. You're going to fail. But if your faith is strengthened, then your works will start to change, and you don't have to try. The Holy Spirit starts working in your life. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. God calls him, Jesus called him a helper. And it starts helping you when you have faith here. Um, yeah, we can't forget that it's because of Jesus' holiness, his obedience, his faith, that we have the privilege to share in the rewards of holiness, even though we're not holy. All it takes is that, however imperfect we are, to put our faith in, in Him and make Him our King, be a part of the kingdom of God, however imperfect you are. And it's by faith. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's what makes Christianity separate than any other religion in the world. Every other religion is you work to get saved. Christianity tells you Jesus did that work for you. Just believe Him. I hope this mindset helps lead us all to a deeper state of understanding, uh, not just about this psalm, but about, about the Bible in general, about, about Scripture. Um, and it helps us worship throughout our lives, throughout our days, while we're thinking about the gospel, while we're thinking about what Jesus did for us. I hope this helps us, gives, gives you a little fuel for the fire of worship. So that wraps up Psalm 118. Um, next week, Neil's going to come, continue to teach through the book of Ephesians. Uh, two weeks from now, we're going to be going through Psalm 110. Uh, pray for me while I prepare for this. I've never, I've never studied uh, this in depth at all on Psalm 118, <laughs> ever. I've certainly never taught on it. I thought I could do it in one night. I can barely do it in two, as you can see. Um, so Psalm 110 is the most quoted uh, chapter or most quoted psalm in the entire New Testament. It's quoted everywhere. Everybody quotes it all over the place. So I'm going to try to, as a, as a teacher, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to learn and, and what to teach and what to leave out. It's hard for me to leave things out. It really is. I like it all. However little and minute the detail is, however boring it is, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Um, so pray for me. You know, I want to grow as a teacher. And, and pray for me as I study it so that I can be true to God's Word and... Uh, and His Holy Spirit will, will, will help me learn things. So, yeah. All right, well, let's pray. We'll be done for the night. Father God, thank You so much for Your prophets. Thank You for the Psalms. Thank You for giving us a reason to hope. Thank You for giving us a, a solid reason to believe. Jesus, You said to the woman at the well, You don't know what You worship but the Jews know what we worship. And God, you've given us that same faith that there is no good reason for these other religions to worship those prophets. They didn't prophesy. Their, their gods aren't real. And God, you gave us solid evidence throughout your word that, Jesus, that there was a Messiah, that you reached out to the world, and that that was the person of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for Jesus. God, I, I, um, I pray over us all this week that, God, that you'd just pour out your Holy Spirit in our lives. Give us people to spread your gospel to. Put those people in our lives. Give us the moments that, we, that, that feel right. Give us discernment on when to spread the gospel and, and, and who to love and... Um, God, use us as tools. Take what we learn here on Wednesday nights and help that prepare us to, to give an answer to any question or, or any rebuttal that anybody has to the faith in you. Um, and God, help us save more and more people. I think we all know you're coming back soon. God, use us as a tool. We want to bring as many people as we can with us. God, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.